Welcome to Health Activators with lifestyle medicine doctor, GP and longevity expert, Dr. Alka Patel. This show will help you to discover a hidden health hacking code that unlocks your phenomenal potential for an outstanding health span, lifespan and wealth span. The show features candid conversations with celebrities, influencers and industry icons, real life stories and cutting edge health activating advice that other doctors might not tell you. Discover why now is the time to join the strategic self-care revolution and experience the profound effect this will have on your personal and professional success. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello, health activators. On today's show is journalist, author, and GBTV's favorite royal news and showbiz commentator, Sarah Louise Robertson. Now, Sarah Louise has worked for more than 20 years as a very, very respected journalist for pretty much all the major newspapers and magazines in very senior editorial roles. What's she done? Well, she's broken major front page scoops and she's been traveling around the world interviewing some of the world's biggest known names. Today, we're talking about female safety, harassments, killings. We're talking about food and health. And we're talking about the shifts in society and human connection. Before we get into today's show, please do support today's show partner, Youth and Earth. Youth and Earth have a range of products that I love to use myself to supercharge my metabolism, to support my health and to slow down cellular aging. Just be sure you click the link in the show notes for exclusive offers, which Youth and Earth are so generously giving for listeners of this show. Welcome, Sarah. So, so happy to have you on the show today. I've got so many reasons that I'm happy to see you, but welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Oh, for sure. Look, it's going to be a great, great conversation because there's quite a few things I want to touch on today. So, first, of course, your amazing career in the media. And I know that you are known for, what are you known for? You're known for your very straightforward and no-nonsense approach to the news, which I have to say I find really refreshing. So I'm looking forward to talking with you about that. And I also want to have a chat about food and your food journey, being vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian, all these words that get bounced around. So it'd be great to, to have a chat about your health journey. But before we do that, there's something that was on my mind, um, just in the context of International Women's Day this mm. month. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to miss this opportunity to talk to you about Jess Phillips. So Jess Phillips, of course, who was in Parliament, reading out the list of names of 120 women it was who've been killed by men in the last year um and i don't know about you but i always find this so evocative and so emotional listening to this and certainly listening to this this month i i did tear up because it's not i guess it's not just a list it's not just statistics i mean there are statistics it's one woman killed every three days mm. by a man mm. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's women with names and lives and hopes and mm. aspirations. And I can't stop thinking about it. I've got a beautiful teenage daughter. Of course, I worry about her at times. But I wanted to ask you, what's what's your reaction? Well, it's something I do feel very strongly about. And thank you for, for bringing it up. It's very timely, as you say, with, with International Women's Day. Uh, in my role as a journalist, last year, I did a sit-down interview with the sister of murdered Labour MP Jo Cox. So that's Kim Ledbetter. She's an MP herself for the Labour Party up in, up in Batley. And she made a documentary about it. And I interviewed her about this documentary. And it was to do with um, the death threats that MPs are facing, but also the, the female harassment that's going on. Um, and I remember being told some quite strong statistics during that. Um, the Labour MP now Shah, another woman, she she revealed that she had death threats in her job, but also the, it's the fact that it was women. It seemed to be specifically targeted at, at you know, many female MPs, um, and it was just shocking that that was going on. And you know, we live in a country where we're meant to have democracy, and obviously everyone has their say. But when it comes down to people's lives being threatened things have, have, have gone too far and there needs to be something done and and I sort of really sort of got into researching this and 
and you know one in three women over the age of 16 were subjected to at least one form of harassment in 2021. This has now increased to two in three women between the ages of 16 and 34 who are the target of, of unwanted sexual harassment and I myself have, have been a victim of that um, multiple times I have to say uh, most recently in the last few weeks, that's an ongoing police investigation um, as to what happened to me. And it's something very distressing and, yeah, it's had, it's had a massive impact on me. And I just feel mm -hmm. now enough yeah, that is can, enough. Can you share what happened to you or how that's at least left you feeling um, at the moment? It's left me feeling quite vulnerable. It's left me feeling like I not, I don't want to use I'm still I'm still confident, but I'm more hesitant now to speak up in a situation in fear of, of what possible retribution there could be. Um, it was something I was discussing with with former editors of mine just, just earlier today and I was relaying my, my own personal experience from a few weeks ago and they themselves, you know, agreed and, and said in a situation, a volatile situation, they might not feel as confident to speak up because of what that retribution could be from, from the perpetrator and I don't know if men feel like that, if they live under that sort of cloud of, of fear but there's something wrong in society if, you know, I pride myself on being a really strong, confident alpha female who has always stood up for what's right in life and never been afraid to speak her mind. But it has carried an impact what's happened to me. And I think it's the culmination of, of other things as well. And I now second guess myself, question, is that the right thing to do? Instead of just acting straight away, I now sit back and, and take time to, to reflect. But I think it's, it's definitely made me cautious and wary and wary of, of, of people. And it does have an impact even on my train journey. I, a, a man stood too close to me. He, he stood right up against me when I was on the train and, and my immediate reaction was to shy away because I thought he was coming to to hurt me and that might sound overreactive and I it would have been a few years ago I would not have reacted in that way to that but because of this incident that's happened it's made me question you know people's actions and what they're going to do and what their intention is and it's not nice to feel like that and no woman should be made to feel like that they really shouldn't not in this day and age and not in not in Britain. No, gosh, I'm sorry you've had to experience that. And as you say, the repercussion of that drops into everyday life, everyday it life does. where you're meant to feel yeah. safe, right? You know, it's a basic human need mm. is safety. And if you're not feeling safe on your walk home from work mm. or coming home from a late night out or even in your own home, because you've talked about harassment, mm. but certainly some of the cases have gone beyond mm. this to, mm. to killing, yeah. of course. Well, and, you know, and that's, that's the bigger thing, yes, isn't well, it? Well, that's what nearly happened to me. Things spiralled out of control very quickly from a situation and that, that's why I'm feeling very vulnerable because, because of how it made me realise how quickly your life can change in seconds and really you're not in control you think you're in control but you're not um and that's when you have that realization it, it does shake you up it makes you reassess reassess everything but i don't this isn't me being a victim or, or woe is me that's not who i am i'm still very strong very confident um and i won't i don't want to be a fearful person i don't i don't want to live my life like that but I've certainly become more wary and more cautious of my surroundings. As you say, coming back at night, it's, you know, you, you, you do sort of look around and 
you know, just check who's who's there. Is anyone following you? Um, I've been taking taxis a lot more than what I would um, if it's been in the evening, late at night. I've been told to, um, you know, if I am going to use public transport, what, what stations on the TFL line are safe to park as? That's as a woman. I mean, it's amazing that I've even had those conversations with it is. I mean, I'm, with I'm, staff. I'm flabbergasted in a way yeah. about this because, you know, I wonder how many men would get onto this con- same conversation and say, oh, I too look behind me every few minutes yeah. when I'm walking home. Or I too check where is it safe. I didn't used to. This is the thing. Um, I was always very confident, very, you know, bring it on. I can give it back as good as mm-hmm. as good as I get. I'm from Newcastle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> As north northeastern women are, are strong, you know. We're made from strong stock. Um but it was as you get older you do you're not as fearless maybe as when you're much younger. And when faced with the situation that I was faced with. Of course, of course. There's a vulnerability isn't there. You're describing a, a vulnerability yeah. that's perhaps always been in there but it's not needed to be at the forefront because you've been able yeah, to Yeah, but I don't want it to be in there and I won't mm. I don't want what happened to me to change me in any way and it won't. Um I think it's just gonna take a little, a little bit of time more um sure. to, you know, get back to, to my normal self, shall we say. Mm. But you're not alone, are you? You're not alone in this Sarah. Yeah. So what do you feel are what do you feel sits underneath this because there are trends aren't there and we we do hear this in the media it's the failure of the police or the failure of the courts or the failures of the health services or social services it's the failure of society and humanity and the one sentence that keeps on coming up whenever these cases do become more high profile because there'll be hundreds of women like you who don't have a voice that gets mm. into the media but but the one the one thing we keep hearing is lessons will be learned it's, that's that, that, well, this is the other part of it. It's very good you thought that out because whenever there is a big case, as you say, David Amos, the MP, went and thought, you know, when he was murdered sadly in, in South End at his constituency, Joe Cox, all these people in the public eye who have lost, lost their lives um, in, in very, very violent circumstances, every time there is that message that's put out, there will be lessons learned yet it happens again so you do take on board that you know those things do resonate with you you might not realize it but it is lodged somewhere at the back of your your mind and then i think the big case was obviously the murder the brutal murder of sarah everard and that shocked every woman of all ages in the country particularly women with daughters like yourself um who want to know that their their daughters are safe walking around as she should have been and that was at the hands of, of, of a policeman, the very people who were meant to protect you. So that was a huge, huge wake-up call. But I also think it definitely had a detrimental effect on, on women's psyche across the UK because you thought to yourself, that could have been me. That could have been any one of us at that moment. And I think that's why I maybe had the... Um, a reaction that I did have to my own incident a few weeks ago, which is still very fresh, um, because of what happened to Sarah Everard. Maybe if what happened to Sarah Everard hadn't happened, I may have been a bit more laissez-faire, you know, just sort of accepted this abuse. Um, not that you should ever accept it, but maybe have fought back or, or what have you. Um, but I think because of what happened to Sarah Everard, I, my, my instinct was to, you know, shout for help and I called, called the police and that's what, that's what I did. I froze, um, at the thought of what could happen. Um, and then I had my phone thankfully in my hand and I rang 999 and, and got straight through to the police and reported it. And the police said that I did the right thing doing that immediately there and then that was the the right thing to do i mean again you know bravo and bravado for for doing that but there's also aren't there stories of women who aren't taken seriously by the police as you say the very people who are meant to 
respond to us when they do ask for help? And so how do we make this happen? How how are you in campaigning now? Is this something that you're feeling so strongly about that in your media position, in your media roles, it's something that you want to really champion and make a change? And if that if that's right, then how how do you make this happen? Sarah? Very much. And this is this is now. I feel like this has unleashed something in me that it's probably always been there <laughs> because um, I do feel very passionate about causes and and when I do get my teeth stuck into something that I feel really strongly about I'm like a dog with a bone um, so now I, I really want to get a, a media campaign going with with a newspaper that's something I'm looking into doing and I want to try and just clean up the streets so women feel safe when walking around other incidents that have happened to me when I've been coming back from a jog in the middle of the day in broad daylight with lots of people around, being the target of unwanted sexual harassment and intimidation. And it's, it's always from men in cars um, mm. or vans. Um, there's obviously a danger with that because they can grab you and drag you in, as what we saw with, with Sarah Everard. And, and I just thought, enough is enough enough is enough like if you're walking around you should be able to walk around in this country without fear of a man trying to intimidate you sexually harassing you and goodness knows what else you know comes down the line from that you should be able to walk around just as men do without worrying of instance like that happening to you you know you're just you're really making me think about even how some of our most subconscious decisions are made with this fear in mind i mean just to give you one of my examples i'm i'm running at the moment training mm. for the london marathon which is coming up and subconsciously i won't go and run in the park that goes around a lake which is beautiful and i know would make me feel so uplifted and free but instead, I'm choosing to run down a road which is busy with lots of people. Mm -hmm. And that's not really where I want to be. But these, this fear, it's somehow it's now impregnated, isn't it? That Very much. We have to be careful and that our choices are based on that. Yeah. And that is not how we should be making our choices. I, I, yes. I mean, I mean, I'm, you know, I've been a hard-hitting journalist um, for, yeah. for two decades now. And I've been in some precarious situations in the past with, with my job, um, worked up in Scotland, worked in Leeds, worked in Newcastle, worked in London for a number of years. And I've been in some, you know, quite out there situations where you do have to have your wits about you. But I've never, I've never felt intimidated. I felt scared. That was what was interesting. I'm not someone who scares who scares? That's just not who I am as a character. As I say, I'm a, I'm a very, very strong person. But I think the last couple of years of the lockdown and we're not mixing together still the way that we used to as a society. It's just, something's just fundamentally shifted. I can't pinpoint what that is, but I really feel there's been a fundamental shift somewhere in society. I don't know if it's a breakdown of society I don't know if it's a lack of community as much, but you certainly do feel more alone now. And that really you only have yourself to, to rely on and that you are vulnerable. You are vulnerable at someone else's hands. Um, and it's, it's definitely been a, been a, a wake up call to just be maybe less not less, I don't, I don't want to use that word. Um, just more safe, safety aware. Just really have your wits about you. Yeah. It's, 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 it's that awareness, isn't it? But not an awareness that raises your stress levels. Yeah, but I used to take all of that in my stride. I mean, I, 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 God, I was sent to some huge stories when, when I worked up in Glasgow for, for the national tabloids up there. And very horrible situations now that I think about that I was placed in but at the time because I was so eager to make it as a journalist you it was like almost like an initiation and and I was fearless so I just would say yeah I'll do it you know I'll go in there um and go wading in so maybe you do change as you get older and you become 
more aware that you are more fragile and you have to be a bit more risk averse, don't you? But I think that's sad and I don't, I've never wanted to be like that. I want, I still want to be who I am, which is strong and able to take anyone on. Yeah, but it sounds to me, it, and it, but it sounds to me, Sarah, as though that's exactly what you're doing now. You're going from that space of vulnerability and turning that into a strength to champion a bigger campaign. Yes, and this isn't an anti-men rant. That's very much, I don't want to go down that. I mean, I do, you know, I'm also like obviously advocating for women, but I'm not trying to use some sort of blanket approach on on, on men. That's not yeah. at all the case. I'm just saying what's, there's something fundamentally wrong that women, as the figures speak for themselves, that women are coming to more harm than ever before. And as, as society, you know, evolutionary wise, that should be happening less and less. But it's becoming worse and worse. So what's going on? Why, why is this happening in the last couple of years? What, what is the reason? Is it lack of law and order? This, this is what I want to know. Is it a lack of law and order? Or is it something's changed in people psychologically that they're not scared of, of retribution? They're not scared of the law? Um, what's making the compulsion to do this? That they think this is normal and that they're entitled to do it. I, there's a lot of questions. There is, there is. But I think certainly from what you're saying, what's suddenly resonating with me is, is the health side of things, mm. from emotional health, mental health, physical health, all of this is what is contributing to, of course, making you the person that you are and filtering into your actions as well. And so when you talk about where does this responsibility lie, which I was alluding to earlier, is is it law and order or is it the fundamentals of healthy, happy humanity yeah. and society? And what is that? What is that? So, well, look, well, we, we could keep talking about this this subject, couldn't we? And I, you know, really look forward to uh, to what you're doing next with it. And I would not be surprised with the thousands and thousands of voices that are going to come out. I really hope so. I really hope so. Because, as I say, I feel very, very strongly about this, and there has to be some sort of change. And maybe it starts in schools. Maybe it starts with the young and better better education better social awareness i think there is a, a, a there is a link to this breakdown of social cohesion in society i think that does play play a part um maybe people don't feel wanted not excusing them in any way but there's, there's something transitions that they want to act like this and they want to do this and it does I don't even think it is, I think when they're doing it, what, what do they say? They say it's power, isn't it? It's about having power and control over you. So, and people have lost control in their lives, haven't they? Mm -hmm. So let me, let me move the conversation yes. in another direction on the basis of that, actually, yes. which is uh, still fits with this theme of control. But I'd like to talk about uh, another part of your health, if I may, because um, I understand you were told at some point in your health journey that you have iron deficiency, but somehow your control around how you dealt with that I think might have been taken away from you. But tell me, first of all, how did that diagnosis of iron deficiency oh i mean it was it was it was a long time ago now so when i was younger i um started exploring like being a vegetarian vegan long before it was fashionable i mean now everyone's doing it but i was doing that years and years ago um as a teenager and i was like right i'm never going to eat meat you know i wouldn't touch fish i sort of turned my nose up and everything and just basically <laughs> I can't even remember now what I lived off. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it did take its toll. It just didn't work for me. I was becoming tired. I was looking really pale. Um, getting so many bugs, like tonsillitis constantly, um, chest infections, cold flu, whatever was going around, I was picking it up. But I wouldn't listen to anyone who was saying... So I think you really need to start, you know, eating some protein. You need to, you know, bring meat back into your diet. So for sort of three or four years, um, 
maybe even longer actually, about five years, I sort of struggled, struggled on really. Um, and you almost become used to how you are. I just thought, this is me. I'm just someone who's going to be maybe sickly. <sighs> I never get sick now. That's the irony. <laughs> but that's what I thought. I thought oh, I'm going to be someone who's just going to be a sickly person. Like something out of a Jane, um, yeah, Bronte novel, Charlotte Bronte, <laughs> like Jane Eyre. <laughs> Take to my bed for the consumption. <laughs> that's, that's how I just envisage life going forward. I had romantic notions as a teenager. And um, I ended up, you know, getting ill again. And my mum said, go to the doctors, make a GP's appointment, see what they say. So I went in and I had this amazing American GP. And, and she ran a series of blood tests. And she said, you're, you're severely anemic. And you need to start iron straight away. And she asked, you know, if you've kept things out of your diet and I said well I don't eat this and I went through the list and she said what do you eat um I mean I was so thin <laughs> I mean teenagers are but I was so so thin I looked back at pictures now and I was like thick um <laughs> but I sort of sat and thought all oh, right and and then I went on a summer holiday with friends um big big sort of family family group lots of older people and it was in Spain and Veg Spain at that time didn't did, didn't cater for vegetarian. Certainly not vegan, but definitely <laughs> definitely not vegetarian. <laughs> and, and so we were on this holiday, and it was like, what do I eat? It's just bread and salad. I couldn't live off, live off that for a month when I'm away for a month. Could I? And and so one night, um, a couple of sort of like the family friends of the group, they were sort of in their twenties, and it also helped that they were cute boys and. Stuff. <laughs> and, and so they said to her, like, try this. I think you'll really like it. And it was a piece of fish. Um, and I ate it and I thought, oh, it's actually really nice. And that mm. just sparked. And um, that holiday, I just reintroduced fish, reintroduced chicken, even ate rabbit on that holiday, you know, everything. Mm. And, and when I came back, I was just like a different person. I just looked so healthy and obviously having a tan, an amazing tan. Um, I used to tan really well then. Um, but just having that really good nutritious food and everything was cooked fresh, but having fish every day, having a piece of meat every day, having that protein. And I went back and got all my tests done and my iron had shot back up to normal range. And, and the bugs, everything, just sort of went away and I just became like other people who just got a cold once or twice a year and and I've never looked back since then so while I do admire because I'm very a big advocate for wildlife and I love animals and you know I give money to to animal charities and support wherever I can their welfare for for me it's it's about my health and until there's a viable way of my body getting those nutrients without meat and fish then I've got to I, you know for me it's, I, I've got to have that in my body it just does not work for me as it does as it, other people thrive I have a friend who's vegan and she's one of the healthiest people I know and she's been like that for a number of years and and she thrives on it but everyone has different constitutions it's not a one size fit all and what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else because we've all got different immune systems we've all got different systems in our gut and there's such a lot going on with the gut um in people you know we're exploring science is exploring that more and more isn't there the link between the gut and the brain and your overall health so all those things but for me i have to have protein every day of some sort of animal or fish product it's, it's just something that i need and that, it's, uh, thank you for sharing that, Sarah, and going back in time mm. to, to take us to those uh, teenage years yeah. of uh, rebellion. <laughs> but, um, and it, you know, the biggest thing you've hit on there is really about individualization. Yeah. It's just yeah. needing to know yourself. Because the problem is there's so many myths out there. And sadly, that is a, there is a bit of a myth that you don't get enough iron without eating meat. Um, Plant-based nutrition causes iron deficiency. Mm. You'll be anemic if you don't eat meat. And whilst that might play out for some people, as you say, just because of, of, of approach and makeup, the problem that that sort of information has with it being out there is it 
it almost stops as well people who might follow a plant-based approach to eating and reap some of those health benefits of that and they end up reverting to eating meat even though that might not be what they want to do and then raises other issues potentially with eating meat i mean i'm not a sort of you know anti-meat um what i'm going to get at is having choice because yeah. you've got to know what your goals are you know is it living longer is it muscle gain is it is it weight loss is it weight gain mm. is it feeling more or energized but ultimately you have to have choice and myths around you can't possibly be vegetarian or vegan and and have enough iron is is wrong yeah. because you can get plenty of iron from plant-based foods yes I, I it just didn't work for me i mean maybe because i was younger than as well i wasn't it was a different time as well and it it wasn't something that was a, a trend it was I, I was the only person i think at my school um who who was that way <laughs> so it was very different I mean, i'm sure now at school most people are or have follow all sorts of fads but back then i was like a, an anomaly um you know i was like a lone, your own yeah staff. i was, I was and, and i'd have to stick up for vegetarianism and be laughed at <laughs> i take all the abuse all the flap but it, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't working for my body but i don't sit eating bacon sausages i don't eat that stuff i'm very every, when i do eat meat it has to be organic mm. it has to be grass-fed um i'm very careful about obviously not having too much so it's just mm. Every, every day or every other day alternating it with oily fish because I'm so I'm a huge believer in food as medicine and you are what you eat and what you eat reflects on the outside and I've, I've always advocated for that I really do believe it and and so everything I eat is about health that's how I look at it is this is this what's this fish going to do for me it's oily it's great salmon it's going to be great for feeding my skin, you know, having those essential fatty acids, all of those things, you know. So I try and have a lot of fish. And then when I need, I have a piece of red meat every week, just one piece. Um, that's my allowance for the week. And then a bit of chicken um, or a bit of turkey elsewhere, like in between. So I sort of, reflect, I alternate every other day with something but I also yeah. eat lots and lots and lots of green veg I'm very much about the green leafy veg and I eat so exactly. much fruit ridiculous amounts of fruit yeah. <laughs> and there's loads of iron in that as well yeah. you know, the dark veg the soya the tofu the chickpeas the avocados yeah. even the dark chocolate so you know there is there is scope and it's also again as you say probably as a teenager you weren't really thinking about how you were cooking your food or no. sourcing, sourcing your food but, you know, cooking changes it. Mm. Uh, things like vitamin C or what you're drinking with your meals can make a difference. And having kind of red wine with with your uh, with your veg is not going to help with iron absorption. So, you know, there's so many little kind of uh, ways that you can maximise your absorption. But as you say, uh, just having that intel in yourself is, as you say, every mouthful is giving your body information. Yeah. And knowing how that then is actually playing out and, and how you feel and what you do and your energy levels and, and the way you look, mm. um, both internally and externally. And we can talk about gut health as well, but um, which is, as I say, coming, uh, there's so much more kind of science around uh, that connection between the, the gut microbiome and, the, mm. and what's going on with, uh, with all of your clarity and DNA repair and, and health in general. So, And I love that. I love that that, that sort of relationship with yeah. food is food and health going hand in hand and that's the relationship that everyone can have with their food just to kind of just pause and really just think about it for a little while but um what about the rest of your health now so fast forward now on to now are there any areas that you might be ignoring do you think well i've got some areas going on um dental wax <laughs> so that's something that that's cropped up um i think i have a tooth abscess starting as as we speak so, so sorry if i look a bit slightly swollen um yeah that's something i've learned recently is, is your gum health plays a massive part in your overall health and people don't realize this so i've always been big like brushing my teeth three times a day um but the dentist said to me recently it's not it's not about the brushing it's flossing and you've got to floss every every day and i think that you know you get home on an evening and you're tired and you know you've done taking your makeup off you've done all your creams and what have you and then you just pick your toothbrush up and you brush your teeth and you just want to go to bed don't you flossing to 
it's, it's another time consuming element and when you're exhausted you've had a really long busy day and you just want to it's, go to sleep you think oh, it's fine. It's, I it's trust crazy, I it? will the mouthwash it's fine <laughs> well the dentist said to me a few weeks ago no sir and Louise you can't get away <laughs> with it you it's got to be something that I um because I have I have Hashimoto's it's something I recently found out so I'm an autoimmune person and and that impacts as well on your gum health so I have to be extra vigilant over other people I know people who get away with murder with their dental mm. hygiene and just maybe brush their teeth once a day or once every other day it's gross I know um but they never seem to have any problems if they ever bother going to the dentist I, I say to them if they ever say anything oh no they tell me my teeth and gums are fine I'm like what it just does not seem fair that I'm having to really really go to so much effort and um, um, we'll have to do so. I've been told for the rest rest of my life. That's just the thing I'm going to have to do. It um, gives you a lot of information, doesn't it? I mean, gum health can give you a lot yeah. of information. We talked about kind of microbiome, which is the bacteria yeah. sitting in your gut. But where does that begin? It begins in, in your mouth, really. And I think so having really a great important. smile is so important. You know, it really is. And I'm, yeah. you know, I want to maintain. My, I've got good teeth, and I really want to maintain that going going forward. So. Yeah, that's my, that's definitely my health thing, I'd say, for this year is, is that and getting on top of that and just, you know, not having those, those gum problems. Well, I live with a dentist. My husband's a dentist. He's going to be super happy when he hears you say this. And he's always well, diligently he can do <laughs> They are very expensive dentists. <laughs> But you know that it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Something that just takes an extra minute, yeah. and we don't make it a priority. And that's the, the whole conversation around health is based on that. Is that not everything needs to take a long time? You don't have to come it out for mm. an hour at the gym. I mean, just like standing up more than you sit down is great for your health. And there's so many small mm. things that we can do that would drop to the bottom of the priority list. And if you can't find a minute, then what's going on? Exactly, exactly. So you do, you do, it's definitely something I, I need to sort of re-look at and you've got to make that time, haven't you? You really do. And I've been guilty over the last few years of not making enough time for self-care, as they call it, for exercise, for, for that. And it's something I'm trying to address going forward and, you know, making that time prioritizing prioritizing that over over other things so as you say making those little changes it, it all adds up and i've been trying to do that as well so instead of sitting when i'm traveling on the train or tube i stand because it's good to you know not be sitting down constantly um using the stairs or if you're going up the escalators running up them it's a good challenge see like how yeah. how out of breath you get <laughs> running upstairs two at a time so i've been trying to do little things like that just to increase um you know the amount of activity that i've got going on i was starting to get into a good routine last year and run up to christmas i was going to the gym two or three times a week for classes and then Christmas came, winter, the horrible weather, and once you sort of do get comfy on your sofa and warm under the under the throes, you think, oh, I can't, I can't face going back out. To go but to I always drink. talk about the minimal effective dose. So what's the minimum you can do to get your feel good and that's still going to have a health benefit for you? Can you do something for a minute and stand up and sit down whilst the... That's a good idea. It's the, it's the small things and that gives you your feel good and you layer that up through the day and it doesn't matter if you haven't been to the gym four times that week because as you've just described, the opportunities to actually zone in on your health are all around you, whether it's the escalators or the stairs or just slowing yeah. down your breathing for yeah. conversation. You know, all these opportunities are there. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm really delighted that you're that you're doing this. And what about um, devices, um, Sarah? Because like you said, you know, we just want things to be easy and quick. So have you got a favorite gadget or device that you enjoy using that you feel supports your health? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I, I mean, I've also got weights. If I do weights at home, if I'm watching the soaps, you know, I'll sometimes just pick them up and do my little bicep curls and 
all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, I try and do that. Not regularly enough. I need to start doing it some more. So that's inspired me for later. Um, but devices, I do take my oxygen sometimes. So I've got an oxygen um, thing. That's good to check. Just check what it takes your heart rate. Um, your resting heart rate, your pulse and everything, and then obviously your oxygen levels. I do check in with that from time to time. Um, I need to invest in an electric toothbrush. That's something I'm going to be going to next. I think that's been restricted to me by my dentist. But um, I'm very into looking after skincare because I've always had really beautiful skin and I really want to maintain maintain the quality of that. So I recently purchased a, a new device, which is like a electronic, um, yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah, so, so yeah, so I do that in the evening, um, and then I've got something that's like, it's sort of like a, it, how can I put, what, what's the word, it's sort of, um, if you're feeling like a bit puffy, you know, you know when you wake up and you just, you know, everything's not, and it's, place as it should be <laughs> yeah i sort of roll around with that um in the morning and it just seems to sort of wake my skin up and just get the the blood circulation going and if i've had like a late night or i've been working late so if i go to a lot of red carpet events with my with my job um so i'm out such a lot in the evenings at parties and what have you so in the morning you can sometimes just have that it keep it to show on your face, can't it, as you get older. So go around. And it's not just the skin. Yeah. I know you're talking about yeah. because you've got beautiful skin and you're you're radiant and you're smiling and you're, you look you look incredible. But do you know you're also affecting health beyond just what you can see by doing that? I mean look at your face, the number of muscles that are in there. Remember all muscles are very connected. So you start massaging the muscles on your face and actually you're having an impact much more lower down as well. Yeah, I grind my teeth as well. I've, I've learned that recently. So I'm going to have to have a retainer. Um, which I don't really want the idea. I don't like the idea of, but, but I do grind. And that's something that I well, need to address. We'll have a chat about um, something called myofascial release. I might sort of talk about this more yeah. until later. If I get a lot of tension. Yes, exactly. Releasing that tension is the most important thing, but it's also back to why are you grinding your teeth, Louise? What is going on with tension in general, and what are you holding there? So you know, there's, a, there's another conversation to be had as well. It's not all just anatomical; it's something else. Oh well, uh, I think we must stop talking because we've been talking for for a long time. So I guess um, a final question, and this is this is a sort of more of a larger esoteric question. We've touched a little bit on it, but what do you think needs to happen for the world to be happier and to be healthier? It's very interesting. I mean, it's it's a conversation in itself. <laughs> we could talk for hours about what needs to happen, but I definitely think world governments, that you know, especially from from capital. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? No, I'm just not going to say just Western governments, but around the world. Um, where there needs to be more of a universal approach to to looking at to protecting their citizens, and that is, I think there needs to be universal health care. So anyone anywhere, if they need emergency health care, can access it without having to pay, which is such the case is the case in in in, in nearly every country. Um, you know, so people around the world don't don't have what we have um and that's a huge thing because health everything comes back to health i'm a really great believer in that if you don't have your health how can you be expected to thrive and and live and and work hard and have a productive life if your health's not there so it's about balance but i also think a huge part of what's going on with people's mental health needs to be addressed and i think that comes down to social media and how we tackle that because social media is a force for good but it's also been a negative force as well for many people and I think it causes terrible anxiety in the young. I know this, I have a niece and I worry for her 
um, for her friends. I can't imagine the pressures that they must be at at school and among their peers with with social media and what their popularity is on on these mediums like TikTok and and I'm glad that that wasn't around when when I was coming through school and we just had freedom to to be ourselves but there's this real danger of constant comparison and I think social media has really brought that on and I don't think it's changed us for for the better I think it brought up people's worst securities and fears and we need to sort of address going forward how how to do that do we have media do we have social media breaks is there a way to do that I do think we'd all be happy if the internet switched off for a couple of days and and people sort of got back to 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 talking to each other and actually having to physically have conversations yeah apparently young people I was told this young people don't go to parties now or or go to clubs and do all the things that we did and that worries me for social human interaction oh Sarah, i know i shouldn't have asked this question see again. i could, you could talk about this for hours <laughs> i would love to have you back on the show so that we can carry on this conversation but it's so appreciative of what you've shared today about oh thank your... you it's been a real pleasure talking to you thank you what an incredible powerhouse of a woman. Strength is what I see in Sarah. And I'm not talking about the strength that she has because she's there doing her biceps curls whilst watching TV. Uh-uh, not that. I'm talking about her strength to share her vulnerability. Because that's what she did today. And what she's shared today about, well, about feeling unsafe in everyday life. That I know is what every woman listening will connect with. I, I know this. And I also know that what she shared today with, well, with absolute honesty, it will have a big ripple effect. A ripple effect that I, I believe will enable other women as well to share their experiences too. And shared experiences, well, that's what results in, in a movement, in a shift, in a change. And it is time for a change, isn't it? And I know for sure that the early part of today's conversation will have stirred up something in many of you and in men too. What could you as a man be doing, perhaps without even realising it, that results in a woman feeling unsafe? And what could you do differently? So as always, if there is anything that you've heard today that has stirred you and you just want to talk, then please do reach out. And you know, the best way to reach me, of course, is through the contact page on my website, dralkapatel.com, or just message me directly on the socials at Dr. Alka Patel UK. And also, well, of course, with my focus on health in this show, what well, Sarah's story in relation to her, her food choices, what it did was also stir up another question, which is, can you get enough iron? From eating plants. So that's what I'll be taking a deeper dive into for next week's hack episode. I'll be looking at what iron is, what is iron, why do we need it, what happens if you don't get enough of it and where to find it so that I can then answer that very question, can you get enough iron from a plant-based diet? Find out next week. In the meantime, I wish you a health-activating day. 